Hi, this is JP Hong. Currently, I'm in Gaza, um, Palestine, and I'm sorry that I cannot be part of your meeting um, at uh, Ukraine. I know that Ukraine is another conflict zone, and I know uh, Sergey and Pavlov have been really working hard uh, to salvage the limbs and help the injured uh, to hopefully one day get back on their feet and go back to a uh, normal life as they know. Um, it is an honor to be invited to the Ukrainian Society of Plastic Surgery uh, annual meeting, and I hope that I could be there in person soon. All my respects to all the surgeons who are working hard uh, to normalize the patients and the country. So today I'll be talking about my experience and share my knowledge in the lower extremity uh, reconstruction. I'm very sure uh, through this kind of conflict that Sergey and Pablo probably has much more experience than me, but I hope to share a little bit of uh, my experience with you. So today I'd like to focus on uh, the soft tissue aspect in traumatic defects of the lower extremity. And a lot of the times uh, when we are faced with uh, trauma of the lower extremity, and if it's a severe trauma, we're often faced in making a decision between salvage and amputation. Uh, there are some um, papers that guide us to make the determination, and there has been a lot of debate in whether amputation or limb salvage, you know, which is more beneficial. But I think one of the biggest study that has been done was the LEAP study, Lower Extremity Assessment Project study. And it actually followed up um, patients for a couple of years. And, and the truth is there was no significant uh, difference in functional outcome. But if you look at a little bit more detail that there was um, finding showing that amputation is actually more expensive and amputation yields fewer uh, life quality adjusted life years uh, than salvage. So I think in a way, as if you ha do have the ability or the time or the environment to do so, uh, limb salvage is definitely worth it. Uh, you know, to make the long story short, I think the conclusion is that whether you decide to salve the limb, limb really depends on many factors. And, and at the end, it really boils down to that individual, that patient. And is that patient is motivated to go through years of rehab uh, is the family supportive? Do you have the right environment? I'm sure during the war, you know, thinking about limb salvage could be very different. So primary, you know, a lot of the times could be amputated. So there are many factors that are involved. And I think you have to uh, determine each factor based on the individual at that time, at that given moment, uh, what is best in his interest. And of course, there are times that when you do need to do amputation, and as plastic surgeons, we often think as reconstructive surgeons that we have no role in amputation. But the truth is there's actually a lot of uh, roles to think about in, in amputation. And when we do think about amputation, you know, we look at you know, factors or, or guidance to make that decision. And the truth is you know, these uh, guidance does give you an, a rough idea on whether you should salvage or not. But in, at the end, it is again, an individualized approach. And even in case of amputation, you do have to make an orthoplastic thinking. Now, orthoplastic thinking is not only thinking about a reconstruction of or resurfacing, but it's thinking about the functional outcome. So for me, thinking about the function, I think the absolute indication is probably if the patient absolutely has no function, no chance of regenerative uh, function. So a high level of nerve injury could probably be one of those indications where we are certain that, you know, the limb is not going to function and that could be considered as an indication. But if it's a low level amputation or low level injury, even if the, um, the nerves are transected and if the regeneration process is going to be short, I think it's worthwhile to think about reconstruction. And of course, if you had a long ischemic time, especially if the distal soft tissue has zero vascularity, I think these are the indications. And the rest, again, it's all about thinking about um, the individual patient itself. Uh, this was a chapter that I wrote for uh, the Nelligan textbook. And it, it clearly shows some of the algorithm that you may consider. But again, it has to do with that individual uh, situation. And as reconstructive surgeons, when we do think about doing amputation, it has to be a orthoplastic approach.
And again, orthoplastic is not only thinking about coverage, it's also thinking about function. And if you're even going to do amputation, longer stump, the better. So there's many roles that we could play as plastic surgeons. Now, this is using a vascularized fibula, a flap to uh, stabilize the distal uh, tibia fibula. And if you're able to use this kind of approach, it will minimize torsion and really gives a, a very good result as Dr. Adinger from Georgetown has clearly shown. So this may be one of the roles where reconstructive surgeons do get involved in, um, in uh, amputation. Another big problem with amputation is that a lot of patients are suffering from a neuroma um, related pain or even phantom pain. And now a peripheral surgery, um, per peripheral nerve intervention, such as targeted muscle reinnovation, where you're hooking up the nerve to the stump of, or the insertion nerve of the muscle, of the targeted muscle, or you're wrapping the nerve ending with a, with a muscle strip, allows to minimize these neuroma a pain and reduce phantom pain as well. So as plastic surgeons, now we're having more roles to play even in, in, um, in times of amputation. And what really helps with uh, these kind of nerve intervention is that these are the platforms that actually eventually leads to creating bionic interface. So even patients with amputation, by creating these kind of interface, we're able to hook up the, the uh, electrodes from, for, from the robot and amplify, amplify the signal and ultimately control the robotic uh, prosthesis and even patients with amputation allow a better function. So there's definitely roles of reconstructive surgeons to play even in amputation scenarios. Now, also what you also have to think in terms of amputation is that don't throw away the tissue. You have to utilize and harvest as much tissue as possible. So, you know, um, so whatever you can harvest the skin or, you know, harvest the skin and use it as a biologic uh, dressing or harvest the free flap and using these spare parts that you're going to throw away is a valuable tool. So here's a case with a severe uh, mangled extremity and this patient, because of the systemic condition uh, and, the, and the old age, we decide to amputate, but we harvest all the skin as much as possible. And then we regraft it on, on the limb that we're trying to salvage or the limb that has a defect and actually use this as a biologic dressing, or sometimes we're lucky that these skin graft actually takes and you don't have to harvest the skin from the other side. So as reconstructive surgeons, get involved in the ER, get involved in the primary assessment, and if possible, harvest as much as possible. This is a patient that we were um, consulted a month after the primary injury. Uh, you could see there's a, a cr clear chronic osteomyelitis and there's a limit to what we can salvage here. So we decide to do an amputation. And when you do decide to do an amputation, what we do is that we harvest as much free tissue as possible as a flap. And then we use that flap to reconstruct the opposite limb. And actually, um, uh, and this saves a donor site. So we're using the spare parts from the other side that's going to be amputated and try to salvage the limb as much as possible. So these are the roles that reconstructive surgeons can play even in times of amputation. Now we all know that if you are considering reconstruction, the key is making good assessment. Of course, you have to do that, uh, assess the vascularity, assess the nerve, assess the bone, and finally assess the soft tissue. I think nowadays uh, what is quite important is that when you assess the, uh, the vascularity, a lot of the population are now aging. And especially if the patient has diabetes or peripheral vascular disease, I think getting a full picture of the whole limb vascularity is quite important because sometimes in these chronic patients with high risks, you could actually see that there's an obstruction of the main femoral artery. And in times the descending branch is the major collateral. So in these kind of cases, if you were to harvest an ALT based on this descending branch, there might be a chance of losing the whole entire limb. So patients with high risk or vascular disease, it is a good idea to get the full picture of the vascularity of the whole extremity. And again, this kind of information gives you where to harvest uh, the, the tissue as well. Another point that I wanna make is, is considering in regards to soft tissue is that if you have multiple defects, 
try to simplify the defect. So if there's a double defect, what we do is we try to um, push one um, defect into with a local flap and creating the other defect larger. Uh, although the defect is created larger, you just need a one simple flap. So doing these kind of double flaps could be sexy, could be uh, efficient, but in a way it increases the risk uh, of, of complication. So trying to make it into a single uh, defect and with a single flap uh, really allows to simplify the approach. I think also what's important is that you have to make the wound clean and, and, and this cannot be overemphasized. Debridement is the key to success in any reconstruction. And I think this is where the MPWT comes in. Uh, we use this to prepare the wound to make sure that these kind of dirty uh, over granulation is compact and it shows a clear uh, red, beefy, compact granulation, which is a sign of good vascularity and also uh, is a sign of clean wound. And these are the types of wound that we want. And this is, I think, where the MPWT plays a vital role in preparing the wound. It could be short as a couple of days, or it could take a couple of weeks. But nevertheless, having these wound transform in these very stable, well-granulated tissue really allows the reconstruction result to have a better outcome. There's a lot of talk about uh, timing. And of course, I agree with uh, you know one of the fathers in lower extreme reconstruction, who is Godina, that earlier reconstruction is better. Because if you wait more, there are scars developing around the pedicle in the, within the zone of injury. And this is why the more you wait, it could be more difficult. But the reality is, if you're in an in a acute trauma center, you're lucky enough to see the wounds early. But in, in a lot of the um, tertiary centers, the wounds are relatively referred late. But now with the advanced um, technique and better knowledge, as long as you dissect um, the, the recipient vessel and as long as you see the pulse, I think nowadays the idea of uh, the timing is less relevant. But again, the clear thing is, uh, is less relevant in terms of complication. But the clear message is here, again, earlier the better. And the reason why delayed reconstruction is difficult is, again, scarring, uh, and around the pedicle, and this really increases the risk. Now, the zone of injury, you know, you have to think of this as a three-dimensional term. Sometimes the zone of injury could be wide when you look at 2D, but how, how can you determine the depth of the injury? So if you think that it's shallow, then it's okay to be in the zone of injury. Look at the pedicles and see if the, pedicle, uh, the, recipient, um, the, if the recipient vessels are spared, and if they are spared, and if you see clear pulsation, uh, you, you know, this is more than safe to use. And this has been documented in, in multiple papers. So don't be afraid to explore within the zone of injury. If you think the wound was deep, uh, it's complex, it's scarred, then of course it's smart to get out of the zone of injury. And we talked about assessing the vascularity, assessing the bone. A lot of the times uh, in large gaps, uh, when the wound is dirty or if, if it's chronic osteomyelitis, when the wound is not certain of debridement. Sometimes it could be acute, dirty wound. If you're not sure, then you know you put an um, antibiotic bead for a while and you come back and do a secondary bone reconstruction. So you have to also take that into mind and really reconstruct with a flap that allows secondary or tertiary uh, procedures. We talked about the importance of debridement and assessing you know, how to close. And finally, uh, you have to select what kind of flap. Another um, a piece of information that I'd like to share with you is in terms of um, the, the, the implants uh, that stabilize the bone. And sometimes the implants may be open. I think the general consensus, and it has been reported by Dr. Levin's group, um, showing that if the uh, wound exposure is more than two weeks, then there's a very high chance of bacterial inosculation. But if the implant exposure or the hardware exposure is less than two weeks, then I think it's safe not to remove the hardware, but just to uh, put the flap after a good debridement. So I think you have to take that into, um, into, into your mind. But again, you have to make the clinical judgment, making sure that the wound is clean. So again, following this kind of algorithm, uh, you know, um, to, to, to provide limb salvage, Again, all evaluations to start with the vascular supply. Uh, 
And if it's adequate, debride, make sure the wound is clean, you know, um, assess the wound, assess the bone. And finally, uh, you consider doing a reconstruction. And this has been the basics of the approach for a long time. But there has been some evolution made um, in, in recent years and some insights that we found that we'd like to share with you um, today. Again, you know, there's many factors to consider uh, when you're thinking about reconstruction. And of course, the goal is not only coverage, but it's functional. Again, orthoplastic thinking, you know, appreciating the orthopedic colleagues and orthopedic colleagues appreciating the plastics needs. And by talking together, uh, by designing the surgery together, we're able to come up with the best possible uh, reconstructive scenario. I think another concept that I want to share with you today is, you know, we've been shifting away from the reconstructive ladder. We see the defect and see, try to do primary closure. If that doesn't work, skin graft. If that doesn't work, local flap. If that doesn't work, free flaps. But nowadays, we're now moving into a more of a one a shot or shotgun approach. We're addressing all the problems simultaneously as much as possible in minimal stages. So that is going to the right um, rung of the ladder and just going straight and, and providing the best ideal approach. Here's a typical case with a patient with you know um, a severe injury, a part of the bone is missing, a lot of the anterior compartment uh, muscles are missing. Um, and as you can see, the vascular is very poor. You assess the patient, you clean the patient, and this is what we had. And you can see that the wound is much cleaner. Uh, the, anterior tibial sec uh, the anterior compartment of the muscle is completely missing. Uh, there's a bone segment missing after stabilizing the bone. And we do an angiogram, and you can see that multiple vessels are missing. Only the posterior tibial is functioning. And you have to design how we're going to approach. So in this case, we're thinking about uh, putting the flap on the anterior tibial uh, artery stump. So here, we're designing the elevator approach. We took the piece of the gracilis as a functional uh, muscle. Uh, for the anterior compartment, the vastus lateralis on the ALT to obliterate the dead space, to control the infection as much as possible, and a large piece of anterolateral thigh for the resurfacing. And this is connected to the anterior stump, uh, anterior tibial artery stump. Uh, again, this is the final result uh, after um, putting in the bone, antibiotic bone spacer, and then remove it, and then doing a secondary fibula. And this is the final result. And similar approaches has been done like this. Again, this is a full segment um, a defect. So here, it's the bone is missing. Uh, resurfacing is needed. So in this case, one stage reconstruction with the fibula. Since the fibula skin is not big enough, we take an ALT together. And this is the final uh, approach. And we're able to simplify this reconstruction. Now, here's a patient with, uh, with an intact uh, hardware. Uh, so... Um, it looks clean, and but there's a huge defect, and we know that there, the the anterior tibial bone needs to be covered. So we take a large ALT and obliterate the dead space with a piece of the muscle, and this is the reconstruction. And you can see the patient is walking with a relatively good coverage and a functional limb, and allows again for the secondary reconstruction because e elevating a skin flap is just easier than elevating a muscle flap. So the muscle flap had a role. Uh, it was known to have a <clears throat> better vascularity, uh, but the truth is there's limited ev uh, there's limited literature on this. Uh, Dr. Mathis has reported the superior vascularity in the muscle flaps, but this has not been since reported. Uh, but it has been a dogma for a long time using muscle because muscle also has the advantage of obliterating obliterating the dead space because it's more um, it's more um, a flexible and it conforms better to the dead space. So here's a patient with an exposed um, a bone and we take a piece of the gracilis and we obliterate the dead space and this is the final result and you have a very reasonable uh, reconstruction. But see as the days pass how the, uh, how the muscle contracts and becomes very thin. And fortunately this patient didn't need a secondary uh, reconstruction, but if you do need a secondary reconstruction, there's a possibility that it could be hard to elevate um, uh, the muscle. I think another challenge when you're putting in muscle to obliterate the dead space is that when you reopen and when you try to find the segment of the bone missing, the scar makes it very difficult for the bone piece to go in. So this is why nowadays we are um, more uh, into putting antibiotic spacers and then covering it uh, with 
uh, with the muscle or skin. Uh, here's a good example of orthoplastic approach. Again, here is an uh, is a prim uh, is a uh, primary reconstruction uh, removal of the bone and soft tissue uh, after sarcoma, and then uh, we put a huge uh, implant, total knee uh, implant, and and we need resurfacing. So in this case, we need a deep fascia to cover the hardware and then skin over that. So I think in this case, uh, a large ALT with the deep fascia intact is the way to go. And this is the final result. Now, I think this illustration, if you see carefully that there is a small scar in the uh, in the middle of the ALT and, and you have to continuously educate the patient. This patient put some hot pack because his knee was aching and, and, and uh, ended up in a small burn. So you have to continuously educate the patients how to take care of their flaps and avoid these kind of unnecessary injury. A lot of the times uh, it's plastic surgery 101. If there's a skin defect, we like to reconstruct it with the skin. If there's a muscle defect, we like to reconstruct it with the muscle. So in selecting flaps, um, we like to consider these kind of options. You know, what is the best possible solution? What kind of um, composition of the soft tissues do we have to take? Do we need fascia? Do we need muscle? Do we need skin? Again, like with like, we also have to take into account uh, donor site morbidity. If you're uh, removing a muscle, there's definitely going to be some donor site morbidity as well. You have to think about the secondary procedures. Uh, what would the orthopedic colleagues appreciate? And of course, you have to think about the overall result in terms of not only coverage, but in function as well. So we take a little bit, uh, we take a step further. And if we're going to select the uh, perforator flaps, you know, we also have to think about the thickness of the flap itself. And I think for me, um, taking all that into account, uh, we prefer to do perforator flaps over muscle flaps unless we need a functional muscle transfer. And if I need to do a large local flap, I'd rather do a free flap uh, to have a complete elevator approach. So when we do uh, think about taking a skin flap, uh, it's basically a perforator flap. And then the things that we take into consideration is that if it's a thigh defect, we rarely need free flaps. It is done with a region, uh, a regional flap. So a lot of the local flaps, if one is not enough, then we do multiple propellers and then we're able to actually close the flap in the thigh. When we do take a free flap, we take uh, how large, the skin dimension is gonna be. Again, what is the composition of the flap needed? Do we need a long or short pedicle? Uh, do we need a thick skin for plantar reconstruction or do we need just any skin for without uh, reconstruction for places without uh, weight bearing? And we also take into account the position of the patient. When you change the patient's position, every time you change a position, there's an increase in risk of patient having complication up to 18%. So these are the things that uh, we take into account. We try to think of it before the surgery, design everything as much as possible, and ultimately, uh, after the debridement, harvest the flab according to the plan. Um, there's a lot of question in uh, considering a muscle versus skin flaps in, in reconstruction. Of course, this is a chronic osteomyelitis case. It's great you obliterate with the muscle. Uh, um, it's known that muscle has also better vascularity and it really conforms well, uh, but sometimes it could be a little bit too bulky. And again, if you do need to do secondary procedures because of the scarring, it could be a bit difficult. So instead of obliterating the bone space with muscle, we've, sh we've shifted into obliterating this bone space with antibiotic spacers or beads as seen in this case and focusing on the resurfacing and then secondarily re, uh, elevating the flap and doing a bone grafts or bone procedures at a second phase. Uh, we looked at our outcome comparing um, the chronic osteomyelitis cases that did muscle flaps versus chronic osteomyelitis cases that did skin uh, flaps. And we actually saw the uh, that there was no difference in outcome. Uh, there was a similar recurrence rate around 8%. If you look at literature, muscle flap is around 10%. So it's not that different. Primary remission rate of using skin flaps in chronic osteomyelitis was 91.6%. Secondary remission rate was 98.3%. So the overall result, if you look at this compared to muscle flap, is equal or slightly better. Now, what is interesting then 
then what factor uh, does determine the overall recurrence of chronic osteomyelitis? Is it muscle composition? Is it is it skin or is it muscle? Uh, you know, is there um, uh, is it age or is it diabetes? Is it smoking? The only two things that we saw relevant in reconstruction of chronic osteomyelitis was both related to vascularity. If the patient has peripheral vascular disease or due to trauma, if the patient only has one major vessel, that is the only significant factor. So what does this tell us? It tells us that poor vascularity leads to poor vascular supply to the bone. So it doesn't matter what flap you use, but you have to take into consideration uh, the overall circulation of the leg. So nowadays, uh, we've sort of uh, migrated from using muscle flaps and using muscular cutaneous flaps. And now we're using antibiotic beads plus muscle. And now we've shifted from antibiotic beads just with uh, skin flaps. But understanding that uh, the importance of the vascularity, uh, the aim for the reconstruction for us has now been shifting to uh, reconstruction of the bone defects, one stage if needed, uh, secondary bone graft after spacers, obliterating uh, the dead space with spacers, uh, controlling the infection, uh, skin coverage using perforator flaps, and we've added that if there's only one vessel, reconstruction of the second major artery uh, can play a pivotal role. So here's a patient with a mangled extremity. Uh, you can see the patient you know, has um, basically no vascular supply, uh, this patient was lucky enough to have the posterior tibial intact. So we reconstructed um, uh, based it on the one, this patient only had one posterior tibial. So again, uh, alignment of the uh, of the bones. And then what we did after stabilizing the wound with MPWT for a couple of weeks, reconstruct the anterior tibial artery with a long vein graft. And then use that vein graft as the arterial source uh, for a complex reconstruction. You can see that the antibiotic spacer is in. Uh, we need to, we, 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 uh, we put an ALT uh, based on that anterior tibial artery, the graft and a nearby vein. And then we're able to have this kind of uh, reconstruction. After removing the antibiotic spacer, we did a secondary fibula free flap uh, based on the same artery. And we're able to have this kind of result after two years of the final surgery. So now our reconstruction is now, especially in chronic osteomyelitis, is now addressing the importance of the secondary uh, arterial supply, maximizing the vascular supply to the uh, extremity. So today we talked about the assessment, uh, how you determine amputation over salvage, and the reconstructive surgeon's role in amputation. We also talked about some basic principle. We talked about how the reconstruction has shifted from the uh, step ladder approach to an elevator approach and what change the elevator approach has brought in terms of selecting the flaps, in using antibiotic beads, in, in, in realizing the true important factors, especially in uh, chronic osteomyelitis, and finally, we showed some uh, outcomes. I think the evolution will continue. Uh, we're finding more and more good insights. So for reconstructive surgeons, I think you, know, you guys are doing a fantastic job uh, in a conflict zone. If you're in a conflict zone, of course, uh, there's going to be more uh, um, sudden decisions uh, that needs to be made. Because of course, these sudden decisions a lot of the times will lead to not uh, to lead to uh, saving lives, and if the systemic condition is in critical condition, of course, amputation has to be made. But somehow, if you're able to salvage the leg, really approach individually. I think as reconstructive surgeons, uh, we need to be continuously curious. We need to continuously uh, challenge the status quo. We have to continuously find the evidence and, of course, share your work. I know Pavlov and Sergey has been sharing their work uh, in many platforms through webinars and through uh, literature. And I am really proud 
to have known them, to have trained them, and to have worked with them, uh, Ukraine before the conflict. So, so again, um, I really want to thank you guys for helping um, the really the in, uh, the injured, the needed patients uh, in your country. Um, and again, thank you for this wonderful invitation. And I apologize again for not being there in person. I hopefully um, will be there as uh, soon as um, I'm able to uh, enter your country. All the best. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And, um, and best of luck. Thank you.